seem worried? They seem worried. They seem worried and nervous as well. He then says he dropped them back off at the police precinct, where a different car eventually took them home. Prince Harry, of course, has railed against the paparazzi for much of his life, accusing them of invading his privacy. I have to do everything I could to protect my family. Though critics say Harry and Meghan also court the cameras and publicity, pointing to their Netflix docuseries. No one sees what's happening behind closed doors. It was 26 years ago this summer that his mother, Princess Diana, died during a car chase in Paris. You get followed, photographed, chased, harassed. The clicking of cameras and the flashes of cameras makes my blood boil. It makes me angry. It takes me back to what happened to my mum and what I experienced when I was a kid. Gabe Gutierrez reporting. Stay with us. Your local headlines. Another check of that forecast coming up after the break. LEX 18, streaming local news 24-7. Search for LEX 18 on your device. Count on LEX 18 News. Coming up, get the latest on multiple cases that will appear in Fayette County courtrooms this morning, including a 90-year-old's murder hearing in connection with a deadly shooting on Pine Street earlier this month. Plus, iPhone stolen. New warning out today explaining how thieves are stealing phones and passwords to get to your personal information. Steps you can take to protect yourself from this recent crime wave. I'm Joe St. George in Washington. It's just about that time when justices begin announcing their most consequential opinions of the term. We break down the four big cases you want to watch next. This is LAX 18 News at Sunrise. We continue right now. It's 5 a.m. sharp. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for watching LAX 18 News at Sunrise on this Thursday, May 18th. I'm Dia Davidson, joined by meteorologist Tom Ackerman with a look at our forecast. Looking good today. We've got a low end chance for maybe a few showers and storms to later on today and on south. But uh, as far as the weekend goes, uh -huh. uh, we'll have more active weather coming in. Not a repeat of what we had earlier in the week with the severe storms, but definitely some shower and storm coverage. A lot of it could very well be Friday night into Saturday. This is a live look from our Lexington Financial Center camera. This is the Max Track. Nothing on it. The future track, more of the same. Now, by late afternoon, clouds start to thicken up down south, and we will see just enough moisture creeping across our southern border that we could see isolated showers, thunder showers here in a few into our southeastern counties. So if you're out there trying to get that grass cut before the weekend, before that main round comes in Friday night, Saturday, Earlier in the day, the better off you are. But again, it's it's a fairly minimal chance, at least here in the bluegrass. We're in the 40s and 50s this morning. It is cool out there and highs today should get into the upper 70s. So not too bad. Our normal high of 76. You're going to go just above that and then even take a crack at 80 tomorrow. There will be a drop behind the cold, but it's not significant. Upper 70s tomorrow, low 70s Saturday. We'll talk about those shower storms and what the rest of the eight-day forecast is looking like. All righty, Tom, thanks so much. 502, time for a check of your top stories on this Thursday morning. A report of a gunman led to lockdowns in our state's capital city around 3 yesterday afternoon. Kentucky State Police said they got a report of a person with a gun at the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet and Mayo Underwood Building in downtown Frankfurt. Now, officials responded, cleared both buildings, and found no sign of any active shooter. We're told there's no threat to the public. Kentucky's app harvest facing several challenges. One of those is forcing its Madison County facility to stop production. This is based on the most recent quarterly report filed last week. App harvest reports it will run out of money by October of this year, despite a $43 million investment made in February. The filing also revealed the discovery of listeria at its salad green facility in Berea. That was in April, which is freezing production. Officials in Louisville have shared an update about Officer Nicholas Wilt. He's the officer shot in the head during the old National Bank mass shooting last month. The Louisville Metro Police Foundation's reporting Officer Wilt is the most awake he's been since that shooting. Wilt has been recovering in the hospital ever since, facing several hurdles, including infections and pneumonia. But Wilt is overcoming the odds by continuing to impress his doctors with his progress. Well, we are following multiple cases in Fayette County courtrooms later this morning. Two people connected to different death investigations in the city. LAX 18's Evan Leake is in studio this morning with what's happening today. Yeah, Dia, said to be a busy morning inside Lexington courtrooms, beginning with a 19-year-old charged for murder sitting for his hearing. Jamarian Allen was arrested and charged earlier this month in connection to a deadly shooting on Pine Street in Lexington. According to police, several people got into a fight that led to shots being fired. 21-year-old Clinton Burnett Brown was shot 
ultimately dying at the hospital from his injuries. Allen is facing murder charges for Brown's death. His hearing set for 830 this morning in Fayette County District Court. The other case we're following this morning is a woman charged in connection to a man's death in Lexington last year and trying to hide his body. Jennifer Kashuba is being arraigned on charges connected to the death of 40 year old Jimmy Lawrence. According to police, Lawrence died from stab wounds and was linked to Kashuba through public assistance housing records. Lawrence's body was found near a dumpster on Cambridge Drive, where he and Kashuba were confirmed to be living together. Kashuba facing manslaughter, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with physical evidence charges. Kashuba is set to be arraigned at 9 o'clock this morning in Fayette County Circuit Court. Dia, back to you. All right, Evan, thank you. It is 5.05 now to an important warning. Thieves are stealing iPhones and passwords, all to hijack your personal information. Stephanie Goss explains how they're doing it and what you can do to protect yourself. Just behind the locked screen of an iPhone, a gold mine of money, memories, and connections. And thieves have found a way in. They're stealing your passcode. It's so sinister. It's so sinister, but also so simple. So they go to places where people are vulnerable. Drunk. People are vulnerable. Yeah. They're drunk. They're having a good time. Joanna Stern covers tech for the Wall Street Journal. She's done a series of reports exposing a new crime wave. Phones being ripped off at bars, leading to tens of thousands of dollars stolen and Apple accounts locked. I was blown away by how many people I heard from that had been to different cities across the U.S. NBC's digital team also helped uncover a ring of thieves allegedly targeting gay bars in Manhattan. Victims are drugged, their phones stolen. Two men, John Umberger and Julio Ramirez, overdosed and died. Three suspects are charged with murder. Taylor Ashey says he too was drugged and a victim of theft, waking up after a night out and realizing his phone was gone. I immediately got up, went to check my computer um, to see what was going on, had about 20 to 25 fraud alert emails. He says the thieves changed his Apple ID password, locked him out, and then went on a shopping spree. They added my um, credit cards to Apple Pay, which I had not previously used, and then they went around New York City using my phone as a credit card. Ashy would get roughly $15,000 back, but what he couldn't get restored was his Apple account. Hours of conversations with Apple support staff. I never received my, my information back. We're talking about personal photos, contacts? All the above. The key is getting the passcode. How quickly can you change my Apple ID? All right, so I'm going to tap here at the top. This is your iCloud or Apple ID uh -huh. area. I'm going to password and security. I'm going to change password. I'm going to put in your passcode. It's in. Is that right? And you're there. And I'm there. It took her 18 seconds, but there's more. These thieves on the streets know how to enable something that's a pretty hidden setting. It's called this recovery key. The recovery key is supposed to add another layer of protection. The problem is, is that the thieves have the recovery key. Once you've changed someone's Apple ID password and turned on this recovery key, it's basically game over for the person whose account that is. In a statement, Apple says, we take all attacks on our users very seriously, no matter how rare. We work tirelessly every day to protect our users' accounts and data and are always investigating additional protections. There are some steps to take. Make the passcode on the iPhone stronger, like using six digits instead of four. You can also go here to passcode options and do a custom alphanumeric code. Another option is going to screen time, then content and privacy restrictions, where there are several places you can add a four digit code that will block access. The changes will make the phone less convenient. I feel like it's Fort Knox on my phone now. But with life's most important information in the palm of your hand, the hassle may be worth it. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, New York. So maybe we'll just go back to those rotary phones and carrying around a whole <laughs> bag full of quarters, huh? Flip phone at least, yeah. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> what about the forecast? Uh, forecast is going to be a warm one today. A few showers and storms possible down south. We'll check out that change. And later on Sunrise, a new prototype has been unveiled by Kraft Heinz. For those looking to take their sauce game to the next level, look at the new dispenser and when you could expect to see it in stores. LAX 18 News at Sunrise continues after this quick break.
All right, guys, it's 511. Here is a never before seen view of the Titanic resting on the ocean floor. Of course, we've seen pictures and videos of 1912 wreckage before, but these scans you're looking at right now from deep sea investigators Magellan and filmmakers Atlantic Productions released yesterday give a full comprehensive picture of the British passenger liner as it looks today. Scans of the wreck were carried out in the summer of 2022. This final digital replica captures the entire wreckage, including both the bow and the stern section, which separated, of course, when it sank. Experts say the project is a game changer and could help uncover more details about the disaster, including exactly how the ship broke apart when she sank. And all I can hear is Celine Dion singing, my heart will go on. Oh, <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's, uh, that's amazing. That is so cool. Uh, the forecast going into the weekend is good. I mean, we've got some, some pretty good weather with some bumps in the road, some shower storms. We actually need some rain, obviously. And uh, I think the timing is actually working in our favor because a lot will go through tomorrow night. So there's that. <laughs> got that going for us. Uh, this is a live look outside through the Max track. Nothing doing this morning. And we will see a chance for a few showers, thunder showers across our southeastern counties. Some news coming out of the National Weather Service out of Jackson. They did do a storm survey, still waiting on confirmation, but preliminary reports show that there was an EF1 tornado that touched down in McGoffin County, right there, Salyersville. They said near Hendricks, uh, there's Fork or so. Uh, yeah, out in uh, McGoffin County there, an EF1 still waiting on the uh, actual wind speeds, which we'll likely have an update on later on today. But uh, one confirmed tornado from the, the storms earlier in the week, and of course all that wind damage and that large hail that we had to deal with. Fortunately, it's fairly tranquil midweek, and even more fortunately, the round that's coming through tomorrow night into f Saturday morning uh, doesn't look to be severe, but we'll have some rumbles of thunder and some uh, pretty good chances for rain there. So. The weekend will be impacted by active weather. Much of next week looks to be on the quiet side as well. Here's the future track. Sunny to start off, gradually increasing cloud cover throughout the day. And there it is, a hit or miss shower, thunder shower, especially into our eastern, southeastern counties, a lower threat here, isolated. But it is still possible. So, you know, if you're out trying to get a last minute uh, lawn mow in before the rain sets in for the weekend. If you're working outside, just keep your eye on the sky, especially down south for that limited development that we could see today. More than limited, more than likely widespread as we get a forcing mechanism in here this cold front Friday night. Showers, thunder showers likely. Again, don't expect severe weather, but definitely we'll have some active weather blowing through. And then even in the Saturday morning, we'll have some lingering showers on the back end of that cold front before it finally pushes east. Then we clear out by Saturday afternoon and Saturday night. Our percentages of normal rainfall have been talking about how down we are. Well, we're back up again a little bit thanks to that recent rain, couple waves that we've had. Getting rain at regular intervals is certainly helpful and this Friday night round could easily throw a half an inch to over an inch or more our way. So it could be a pretty good soaking for some and a lot of it again will go through overnight. It's 49 degrees in Lexington out of Bluegrass Airport. It is chilly. It is dry. The dew points down the 40s and 30s. So uh, that just accentuates how cool it feels outside. And highs today are going to be in the upper 70s, but again, with a bit of a northeasterly wind holding on, more easterly by later on today, the humidity is not a factor really. So it's very comfortable and it's also warm. Upper 70s tomorrow, brief dip with that cold front going through. And the three-day forecast shows that temperatures do take a little bit of a hit. Low 70s Saturday on the back end of that front. So for today, we're in great shape. Here in the bluegrass, we'll mainly just see increasing cloud cover by late in the day. Better chance for a few showers, thunder showers down south. Now, if we break down the hourly rain chance tomorrow, notice how it really didn't get going until Friday evening. So if you've got outdoor plans Friday night, know that you've got that chance for showers and some thunder showers moving in. Saturday, it'll be mainly in the morning, and we could have a dry, warm stretch of days next week. Friday, Tom, thanks so very much. Well, let's shift gears now. Will student loan forgiveness actually happen? Conservatives want it blocked as a part of the debt ceiling negotiations, but the policy may get blocked by the United States Supreme Court. Well, today, justices are expected to announce some decisions, and while the court never reveals in advance what cases get decided on which days, LAX 18 political editor Joe St. George has this in-depth look at the four main issues that will get rulings before the end of June, impacting more than just your family's finances.
Well, it's about that time of year. Leaves are now on the trees. The last sign of spring has emerged. And politically here in Washington, that means one thing. The Supreme Court of the United States is getting ready to issue their rulings. Everything from your family's finances to the future of the Internet is at stake. Big issue number one, student loan forgiveness. <laughs> It's been a few months since rallies happened outside the court supporting President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. As a reminder, the president wants 10 grand forgiven for individuals making less than 125,000 a year. $20,000 could be forgiven if you received Pell Grants while in college. When the high court rules, it also starts the clock for when student loan payments begin again. Studentaid.gov says that happens 60 days after litigation ends. Big issue number two, the future of the internet. Two cases deal with whether social media sites like YouTube and Twitter are liable for the content that gets posted. If justices rule that social media sites are accountable, it could mean new restrictions on what can be posted online since companies will want to limit litigation. Big issue number three race. There are a couple of cases on this one. First, the Supreme Court will decide whether applications to go to college can include questions about race. Already, nine states outlaw the practice. The Supreme Court's opinion could ban it nationwide, deeming it violates equal protection laws. And then there is race and elections. Justices will rule whether Alabama properly drew its congressional districts. Currently, around a quarter of the voters in the state are black. However, only one congressional district is made up of majority black voters. The court's opinion could make it easier for lawmakers to draw maps nationwide without the worry of lawsuits regarding race. And finally, big issue number four, religious liberty. This case involves a web designer from Colorado. She wants to start designing wedding websites, but says her faith won't allow her to create ones for same-sex couples. She would like the Supreme Court to say it's okay, even though the state has already told her she needs to serve everyone if she wants to operate. In recent years, justices have sided with bakers and coaches in cases where religious liberty was allegedly threatened. Critics fear the opinion could open the door for more denials of constitutional rights for LGBTQ plus Americans. Joe St. George, Scripps News, Washington. Well, according to the White House, if President Biden's student loan relief plan goes through, there are 563,300 Kentuckians eligible for up to a $10,000 relief, as well as 394,000 Pell Grant recipients who could get up to $20,000 forgiven. This means more than $13.5 billion in student loan debt could be forgiven just here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It is 518. Stay tuned. Your Consumer Watch report is coming up after this quick break. Well, it's coming up on 521. Welcome back to Sunrise. It's time for your Consumer Watch. Hopes that a debt ceiling deal will be reached since stocks soaring yesterday on Wall Street. Now all three major indices are on pace to see gains for the week. Investors are also looking ahead to Thursday when they're hoping for more positive news from existing home sales and weekly jobless claims. Stay tuned for a check of your stocks with ties to Central Kentucky coming up about 6.15. Montana's governor has signed a bill that bans TikTok in his state. The social media app has been prohibited for state business in Montana since last year. But the new bill forbids it from being offered on mobile app stores to any users in the state of Montana. As for how it can be enforced, well, that's a big question. You see, a TikTok spokesperson says even the bill's champions admit there's no real way to do so. The governor wanted to amend the bill to expand the ban to any social media platform that sends user data to a foreign adversary. The legislative session ended before that amendment could be considered. Parents will soon be able to put their teens in Uber vehicles. Ride hailing service is rolling out a new feature that will allow kids ages 13 to 17 to ride alone for the first time. Once their parents or caretakers hail a ride for the teen, they will be able to give the driver a unique PIN number. Then the app records audio during that ride and parents can follow the trip's progress. Parents can contact the driver or Uber support team at any time during that ride. Uber says only highly rated and experienced drivers will be allowed to provide rides to unaccompanied teens. The feature is slated to go live Monday in more than a dozen metro areas. The busiest day for the air travel season is, of course, Memorial Day rush. It's only a week away. The Federal Aviation Administration is reporting next Thursday will be the busiest day of the holiday weekend with more than 51,000 flights scheduled on May 25th. 
FAA plans to handle more than 312,000 flights between May 24th and May 30th. While that is a lot of flights, it's still not as many when compared to the same period in 2019 before the pandemic. But earlier this week, AAA forecasted the number of airline passengers over a holiday weekend will be up 11% as compared to the levels in 2019. And Kraft Heinz has created this prototype of a dipping sauce dispenser called the Heinz Remix. It has sauce bases, including ketchup, ranch, and barbecue sauce. Customers can pick one and mix it with flavor enhancers like jalapeno, smoky chipotle, buffalo, and mango. Those extra flavors can each be added at low, medium, or high intensities. The base options could change over time of relief for those already concerned about the lack of mayo. The whole Kraft Heinz plans to start running pilot programs with the product in restaurants from late 2023 into early next year. It is coming up now on 524. Coming up after the break, a look at what people are talking about online. A new beer is hitting store shelves, but this one's for cooking. Plus, Alabama could soon have a state cookie. We'll take a look at the yellow hammer and what makes it so special when sunrise returns. 526, let's talk about a few stories trending on this Thursday morning. The oldest Hebrew Bible in the world sold at auction for a record-breaking $38.1 million. It's called the Codex Sassoon and it dates back to the late 9th or early 10th century. It's believed to be the first book form of the Hebrew Bible. In earlier centuries, only portions were written in scroll form, which came to be known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Codex Sassoon includes 792 parchment pages made from animal skins and weighs more than 26 pounds. The head of books and manuscripts at Sotheby's called the Codex Sassoon one of the most important texts in human history. Have you ever heard about a beer can chicken? Well, the poultry company Purdue has, and it's releasing a beer for people who use the grilling technique. It's called Beer Can Chicken Beer, and thankfully, it does not taste like chicken. The idea is to stick the open can into an upright bird for indirect grilling. It's supposed to keep the meat moist and add flavor, and to that end, the beer is a honey double citrus summer ale brewed with traditional seasonings like rosemary and thyme. It's also drinkable, according to the company. Six, six packs is going to cost you about $15 when they go on sale online May 22nd. So how sweet is this? Alabama could soon have a state cookie. And it's all thanks to some students at Trinity Presbyterian School in Montgomery. Here's a look at the cookie. It's called the Yellow Hammer. Trinity fourth grader Mary Claire Cookie came up with the recipe. She says it includes ingredients that are made in Alabama. Trinity fourth graders came up with the idea for a state cookie while studying Alabama history. They found out several states have a state cookie, but Alabama does not. This week, the House of Representatives approved the Yellow Hammer as the state cookie of Alabama. It's now headed to the Senate for approval. It is 528 coming up. The latest in local headlines where we're going to have more on paying your respects to the late Lehman Swan. Plus, Tom's back with another check of your forecast, what you can expect in the day ahead. You're watching LX18 News at Sunrise. We're back after this break. Count on LEX 18 News. Coming up, going to get a look at the key takeaways from Tuesday's primary day. As experts say, Daniel Cameron win in November won't be easy. Plus, in Lexington today, a community is going to say their final goodbyes to State Representative Lehman Swan. And a deadline to reach an agreement on the nation's debt ceiling looms. President Joe Biden reiterates the country will pay its bills and will not default. You're watching LAX 18 News at Sunrise. We continue right now because it's 5.30 a.m. Good morning, everybody. Thanks so much for watching LAX 18 News at Sunrise. It is Thursday, May 18th. I'm Dia Davidson, joined by meteorologist Tom Ackerman with a look at our forecast, and it's going to be... Yeah, one day closer to the weekend. Oh, it's yes. not that bad. Oh, uh, we've got uh, just a small chance for showers out there today. A better chance going into the weekend, though, and a lot of that I think is going to be Friday night. So. There will be some active weather, nothing like the severe storms we had earlier in the week. I've got some news on that that we'll talk about. And the max track is showing clear skies for now. Now the future track does show an increase in cloud cover southern counties. And right there, isolated showers, thunder showers developing into the afternoon. Best place to see them will be down toward the Tennessee border and across eastern counties. It'll be very limited. 
But don't be surprised, especially if you're outside working today and you start to see those clouds thicken up a bit and you've got a lone passing shower, even a rumble of thunder. Better chances come in this weekend. It's 51 at the uh, Kentucky Mesonet site here in Fayette County in the mid 40s in Cynthiana. And look at that upper 70s today near 80 tomorrow back to the low 70s Saturday between Friday and Saturday. There will be a cold front coming through. So in addition to knocking about 10 degrees off the high, we'll also have a more widespread round of showers and storms that we'll check out coming up. Tom, thanks very much. It's 532 with primary behind us now. The focus shifts to November's general election, but experts say there are some important takeaways from Tuesday night's primary. Attorney General Daniel Cameron is now, of course, a Republican nominee for governor set to take on incumbent Democratic Governor Andy Bashir. For the first time, there will be more registered Republicans in the Commonwealth than Democrats, but experts say beating Governor Bashir will not be easy. Polls show he is the most popular Democratic governor in America and his job approval high. Bashir's popularity here is not as surprising as people make it out to be. If you look at the most popular governors, they tend to be people from one party representing an electorate that tilts in the other direction. Another takeaway is big money doesn't always help. Kelly Kraft and her family invested more than $10 million of their own personal wealth into her race, outspending every other candidate. But when the results came in, Kraft ended up in third place, not even close to the winner. Business owners in Madison County are celebrating after people voted to allow countywide alcohol sales until Tuesday night. Large portions of Madison County were dry. Alcohol was either not allowed to be sold or could only be done so on a limited basis and not at all on Sundays. The owner of Apollo Pizza was one of the driving forces behind getting the measure on the ballot. He says the location in northern Madison County would have had to close without those alcohol sales. With going wet the potential just climbs dramatically. And so we can really throw ourselves into this location and really try and make it the best it can be. We don't have to watch people walk in the door, find out that, 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 that this is the one location where you can't get beer at an Apollo pizza and walk back out. There's now a 60 day wait period before alcohol licenses can actually be issued. It is 534. The Lexington community will be coming together to honor and remember a lawmaker who passed away over the weekend. LX187 Leak is in studio with what's happening today. Dia, Layman Swan never allowed his disabilities to define him. Living with cerebral palsy and confined to a wheelchair, he used his disability as a driver to push for expanding rights for people going through what he went through every day. And today, the community he fought for gets their chance to say goodbye. Swan was hospitalized on May 10th for a medical emergency, according to his mother. This past Sunday, four days after he was admitted, the Kentucky State Representative passed away. Swan was elected to office last year and worked with several committees like transportation, health services, economic development, the list goes on, working to create change across the Commonwealth. We spoke to local politicians on Sunday after news of Swan's death broke, sparking a message of thanks to a man who never stopped fighting for Kentuckians. He did not allow his physical challenges, the challenges of his body to hold him back. In politics, it's a world that is oftentimes just so cynical. And every single day he showed up and he found the good in people. A public memorial is being held tonight for the community to say goodbye to State Representative Swan. That's being held at 5 o'clock at Gray Line Station in Lexington, where people are invited to come share stories, reflections, and insights on what Swan meant to them and the legacy he leaves behind. Dia, back to you. All right, Evan, thanks very much. It is 535. President Joe Biden is reiterating the United States will absolutely pay our bills. It's just a matter of reaching a deal with GOP leaders Mitch McConnell and Kevin McCarthy. Before leaving for the G7 summit in Japan, President Biden delivered remarks yesterday President on preventing the first ever default in U.S. history. President seemed optimistic on reaching a debt ceiling deal with Republicans. President Biden said talks have been, quote, civil and respectful and added that everyone in the room understands the weight and gravity of the decisions being made. He insists he's not negotiating to raise the debt ceiling, but rather discussing spending. We're going to come together because there's no alternative to do the right thing for the country. So I'm hopeful the president's team will join House Republicans to produce a responsible spending agreement to raise the debt ceiling. And I'll continue to support Speaker McCarthy 100 percent. 
Well, Wall Street is eyeing negotiations more closely as the deadline looms. Top bank execs are slated to meet with Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen later today. The Biden administration proposing a new rule to prevent students from incurring crippling debt at for-profit colleges it would also apply to certificate programs at nonprofit colleges. An earlier version of the rule was proposed under the Obama administration and later rescinded by the Trump administration in 2019. The department expects to release the final regulation by October. Public comment period would then follow. If successfully finalized by November 1st, the rules will go into effect in July of next year. Well, it is 537. The dates continue to roll for the trial of one of the officers accused in Breonna Taylor's death. Brett Hankinson, who fired several shots through Taylor's apartment and that of her neighbors that night of her raid, is facing federal civil rights violations. Yesterday, the date for the pretrial hearing to begin was set for October 30th. It had previously been pushed back as attorneys claimed they needed more time to go through documents related to the case. Hankinson was previously acquitted of state wanting engagement charges related to the shooting. That charge claimed Hankinson had endangered the lives of Taylor's neighbors when he fired several shots, some of which entered the adjoining apartment. Hankinson is one of four former LMPD officers facing federal civil rights violations in relation to Taylor's case. Happening today, Governor Andy Bashir will give his routine update to the Commonwealth. According to his office, the governor will update Kentuckians on a variety of topics, including economic development, infrastructure improvements, and the state's response to natural disasters. The news conference will be streamed live online. It's set for 1230 this afternoon from the state capitol in Frankfurt. Well, the Kentucky State Fair is headed back to Louisville this August with new experiences, great musical acts, and so much more for the entire family to enjoy. This year's fair is happening from August 17th through the 27th with the theme, Summer Summed Up. Then there will be a wide variety of entertainment options, food choices, and loads of attractions all within the Kentucky Expo Center grounds, including the newly announced Beer Fest. That's going to be happening August 19th in partnership with Louisville Ale Trail. The Texas Roadhouse Concert Series is also making its return to the Kentucky State Fair. Early bird admission tickets, including parking at the Kentucky Expo, on sale now for $9 online at participating Kroger stores and at the Kentucky Expo Center box office. And Kings Island now officially open each and every day for the rest of the season. Opening day at the park was just over one month ago, but the park was only open on the weekends. Well, the water park at Kings Island, Soak City, going to be open May 27th during Memorial Day weekend. Kings Island will honor America's military, open its water park, and debut its brand new fireworks and drones show during Memorial Day weekend. All active and retired military members, including National Guard, Reserves, and veterans, will receive free ticket to Kings Island, plus discounts for friends and family from May 26th through the 29th. Coming up now on 540, Kings Island. Ooh, would we be able to do that this weekend? Um, yeah, you could. Uh, we've got some issues with some showers and storms, but a lot of we, uh, you know, overnight. So, yeah, that's an option. Okay. We'll check out how that weekend's shaping up coming up. And later on Sunrise, it was a beautiful day for baseball yesterday as several local high schools competed in district tournaments. Eli Gain has a look at who's advancing to the next round in this morning's Sunrise Sports. That's coming up after Tom's complete forecast. But before we go to break, let's get a check of those lot jackpots. Tomorrow's Kentucky Mega Millions jackpot, $132 million. And Saturday's Kentucky Powerball jackpot, $162 million. Sunrise going to keep on rolling along after this break. Alaska Airlines, this is the start of our seafood season and we move uh, usually around 14 million pounds of seafood out of the state of Alaska Woo! down to the lower 48 throughout the summer. and. Uh, so this is a really exciting day for us. It's always the, the marker of uh, summer is here or on the way and we're ready for it. Uh, greeted with a kiss, the first shipment of fresh caught Copper River King salmon of the season arrived in Anchorage, Alaska Tuesday. It's an annual tradition to get everyone excited about the summer fishing season. The Boeing 737 arrived at Ted Stevens Anchorage International Airport packed with the Alaska caught fish. Box after box of fresh fish came off the jet, but the first one got a special trip down a red carpet. Catch of the day was headed to a warehouse, then flights to the lower 48 states. The salmon got kissed was served at the Petroleum Club in Anchorage Tuesday night. Wow. 
I bet it smelled real fishy there. Yeah, that was very possible. <laughs> Hopefully, Hopefully a lot of ice. <laughs> For sure. Uh, we've got a pretty good looking forecast going into the weekend with some minor bumps in the road. Minor compared to the right. severe storms yeah. we went through earlier in the week. There's still active weather on the way this weekend, but I'm not anticipating much in the way of Severe Spare stuff, stuff. Okay. so uh, good news there. Uh, let's get a look outside. Our distillery district live camera looking clear, and so is the Max Track. So uh, we do have some updates on that uh, tornadic activity or the potential for tornadic activity. We had those tornado warnings with those storms Tuesday afternoon, and the National Weather Service out of Jackson was out doing storm surveys yesterday, and they have a preliminary report of an EF1 tornado in McGoffin County. Right there is Salyersville. Uh, so it's uh, out in a, a fairly sparsely populated area, but they did uh, pick up wind damage consistent with tornadoes and consistent with EF1 uh, tornado strength, which puts it in the 86 to 110 mile per hour range. Still waiting on confirmation of the actual wind speed there. But uh, yeah, that's the uh, news as far as the storm surveys go. And we may have some additional information later on today. We have a high off to the northeast. We've got a pretty good day on the way today. And then we've got this p.m. a.m. rain chance showers and storms coming in, meaning they'll fire up Friday night, peak overnight and then wrap up Saturday morning. So if you've got to have rain over the weekend, that's about the best timing you can hope for. And there is a low end chance we could see a few showers and storms today. There is some development eastern counties, just enough moisture around daytime heating to spark those. Uh, but then uh, things simmer down. So Friday, much of the day fairly quiet. And then by later in the day, Friday, as this cold front approaches, this is where we'll get hit with that better round. Now, this is around 6 o'clock in the evening. Isolated showers trying to get rolling. The main wave gets going by mid to late evening. This is around 10 o'clock. So if you have outdoor evening events, Early on, you might be OK, but at some point we're going to have these showers and likely some rumbles of thunder blowing through and then some post frontal showers continuing to Saturday morning. So the good news is that's by lunchtime Saturday, a lot of the rain moving east with that front into eastern Kentucky and out of here later in the day. And we need it. Even though we're starting to see rainfall at regular intervals, we're still running an inch and a half over an inch and a half rainfall deficit for the month. And that deficit for the year, which we didn't have a month ago, is continuing uh, to deepen as well. So we could use a shot of rain. And it looks like it could be another anywhere from a quarter to a half an inch, some locations up to an inch of rain Friday night into Saturday morning. So, you know, fingers crossed we get another good soaking and avoid severe weather, which looks like we uh, very well could. 49 degrees, there's a chill in the air. On top of that, the air is very dry. Dew points are down in the 30s and 40s. 50s into our southern counties, so that's dry, comfortable air. So you've got the warmth without the humidity. The wind this morning northeasterly, it'll become more easterly later today. We'll be in the upper 70s for highs. And again, those isolated showers, thunder showers out there. Notice the wind becoming more southeasterly, and tomorrow it'll be pretty much straight out of the south, which means we'll warm up into the upper 70s. We'll also pump moisture in ahead of that approaching cold front. And then here comes that rising shower and storm chance. So active weather to start off the weekend, primarily Friday night, overnight into Saturday morning. So Saturday looks like it's going to rain all day. That's not the case. Uh, that's mainly in the morning. So Saturday afternoon, Saturday night into Sunday, pretty good stuff. And an extended run of what could feel like a little taste of summer there. Not just low 80s, potentially some low to even mid 80s with some sunshine. A big change on the way into next week. We had a beautiful night for some tournament baseball last night. Let's start with the 43rd District semifinal between the top 10 teams, Tate's Creek and Dunbar, getting us all started. Great game. Creek down 7-4 to four in the top of the seventh. Bases were loaded for Brody Dunham, so he represents the go-ahead run. And, well, he nearly does just that. Just missing out on a grand slam, but he does clear the bases, and we are tied. That's five runs in the top of the seventh for the doors. And we eventually go to extras. And then in the bottom of the eighth, Scott Kendrick sends it to the fence and left center allows Harrison Simpson to come all the way around from first. Dunbar walks it off. Bulldogs in the district championship for the first time in 11 years. Here's your game winner. I'll tell you what, it was a grind all game. I think we went, what, eight innings? Eight innings and uh, we had some opportunities and it finally came, but I'll tell you what, if it wasn't for these guys in the dugout, that wasn't anything. I'll tell you all right now, those are my brothers, and I will live with them till the day I die. 
So Dunbar meeting the winner of this one, Lex Kath and LCA. Zach Grigalis at the dish. No man's land into right field. Max DeGraff comes around to score. The Knights are up 1-0 after 1. They'll build on that in the second. Bases chalk for Owen Jenkins. Gives it a ride to center. That's a bases clearing double. LCA did come back and tie it up at 6 at one point. But Lex Cat scores 3 in the 6th inning and goes on to win 9-6. They'll face Dunbar in tonight's 43rd District Championship. Over to softball. LCA hosting Lafayette in the semifinals. This one, all Lafayette. General's up four to one in the bottom of the second. And this is where all the magic happens, run after run. Lafayette just kept it coming. Anaya White on the pop fly, that finds ground for the RBI. Anna Clay Denton shoots it straight out to left. That brings in two more. Up 12 to one heading into the third at that point. Becomes a huge win for Lafayette. They're gonna face Lexington Catholic for the 43rd District crown. Not done on the diamond. Henry Clay taking on Bryan Station on their home field. The defenders up 1-0 in the fourth. Carson Rockbone gets the strikeout. That won't be her last either. Bottom four, Michelle Moore. Short ground ball near the plate. Some defensive chaos for the Blue Devils. Sends Trinity Campbell home, so Station now on top 2-0. Henry Clay not going down without a fight though. Top five, Elise Pearson. Line drive to left for the RBI single. Makes it a one-run game, but Brian Station will hold on from there. Going to win two to one, will face Scott County in the district championship. KVCA Boys Volleyball State Semifinals, also in action last night at Henry Clay. West Jessamine facing Trinity. The Colts lost the first set. Zachary Stowe making his presence known with the power on his hits to keep the Colts in the game. A monster back row spike midway through the second set coming up here. But the Colts trailing the whole set, down 24 to 21, trying to rally late, but it's Trinity going on to finish the job, sweeping the Colts to advance to the final where St. X would go on to get the win. Congrats to West Jessamine and Lafayette boys for making their boys uh, volleyball state semifinal appearances. All right, the NBA Combine continuing yesterday. We got to see Oscar Shibwe taking the floor for a scrimmage. I think it's safe to say may have helped his stock at least a little bit. In true Oscar fashion, he recorded a double-double, 10.16 rebounds. The 16 rebounds was the most by any player out of five draft combine scrimmages that took place. The NBA draft will be next Monday on, or excuse me, next month on June 22nd. But May 31st is the final day for prospects to decide if they want to stay declared for the draft or possibly return to school. We're going to wait on Oscar as well as Chris Livingston's decisions within the next couple of weeks. All right, today's the day. Kentucky men's tennis rematch with Virginia in the NCAA quarterfinals. The Cats and Cavaliers will take the courts this afternoon at 5 o'clock down in Orlando. A rematch from last year's national championship that saw Virginia defeat Kentucky 4 to nothing. But it's a new year, new team, and the Cats aren't wanting this run to end. We love each other and, and we don't want to lose. We don't want to go home. We want to keep it going as a family. Um, but at home, we work really hard. You know, we work on fitness. We, we put the hours in. If we can start maybe a little bit better, uh, the doubles or, or the first hour of singles, uh, I think we will be very, very tough to beat. And also a massive regular series, uh, I should say regular season series finale for the Batcats, taking on the third ranked Florida Gators at 630 tonight over at Kentucky Proud Park. For 18 Sunrise Sports, I'm Eli Gain. Enjoy your day. It's 556 early stage clinical trials are being planned for a universal influenza vaccine. In today's Health Watch, Mandy Gaither has more on how this shot would be different from past flu vaccines and the impact it could have on future flu seasons. <laughs> After a severe flu season, some hope for the future. A universal flu vaccine is said to be studied in humans using the same mRNA technology as Pfizer and Moderna's COVID-19 vaccines, potentially paving a new path to protection. Vaccine targets that go into the vaccine every year are kind of an educated guess. Dr. Ben Singer with Northwestern Medicine says that's why a universal flu vaccine could help. Right now, flu shots only protect against four strains, two influenza A strains and two B strains. 
universal flu vaccine would take away that guesswork. It would give us a vaccine that targets all flu strains. Certain flu strains are known to circulate among humans, but many more are spread among animals. Scientists worry these viruses could jump to humans, suddenly exposing us to viruses our immune systems have never seen. The idea behind a universal flu vaccine is that because it targets a part of the flu virus that is essential to all forms of flu, that it might even be able to prevent humans from acquiring flu strains in those pandemic types of settings. Late last year, researchers said they were able to immunize animals against all 20 known influenza A and B virus strains. Now, the National Institutes of Health is enrolling 50 volunteers ages 18 to 49 for a phase one clinical trial at Duke University. For Health Minute, I'm Mandy Gaither. All several other universal flu vaccines are also in various stages of development and testing. It is 558. Stay right there. Sunrise at 6 is headed your way in just two minutes. LEX18, streaming local news 24 7. Search for LEX18 on your device. Count on LEX18 News. Coming up, reports of a gunman led to lockdowns yesterday at a state office building. Get the latest on the situation as police continue to figure out what led to the incident. Plus, we're following multiple cases in Fayette County courtrooms today, including an arraignment for a woman charged in connection with a man's death last year in Lexington. And an apprentice program looks to show students the different career paths someone could take in the electrical industry. New half hour, Belly X18 News at Sunrise gets underway right now. So rise and shine, everybody. It's a great morning. We're one day closer to Friday. It is Thursday, May 18th. I'm Dia Davidson, joined by meteorologist Tom Ackerman with a look at the forecast. It's a good news, bad news weekend. Uh, uh, more good news than bad news, okay, actually. Okay. So uh, you've got that going for you. We've got a chance for showers and storms, but... A lot of it, I think, would be Friday night into Saturday morning, and we'll, we'll talk much more about that timing. Early this morning, not much to show. The Max track and our downtown view clear. The future track the same. We'll start out with sunshine and end up with gradually increasing cloud cover today. Now, there will be just enough moisture creeping across our southern border to spark the possibility of a few showers and storms south and east, isolated showers and storms here in the bluegrass. So. Just be aware of that possibility, especially if you're out trying to get the grass cut, if you're working outside today. There's that very limited chance that we could have a little bit of active weather into the afternoon. And it's chilly out there. It's 43 in Cynthiana, 45 up in Alexandria and far northern Kentucky. You've even got some upper 40s down in Liberty. Danville's at 46, uh, Harrodsburg upper 40s there. So the three day forecast shows temperatures gradually coming up. Upper 70s today, overnight lows in the mid to upper 50s, but also an increasing chance for showers and storms. And again, a lot of that looks to go through Friday night, overnight into Saturday morning. We'll talk about the timing of the cold front, the overall impact on the weekend coming up. All righty, Tom, thanks so much. 602 reports of a gunman led to lockdowns in Frankfurt yesterday. Thankfully, no one was hurt. Now police are trying to figure out what led to the entire thing. Kentucky State Police reported that they got a report of a person with a gun at the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet at Mayo Underwood Building in downtown Frankfurt. Officers from several agencies responded within minutes and began the process of trying to find a gunman or any possible victims, but Kentucky State Police say they couldn't find anything. They checked each floor of the building and parking garages. This comes just a few weeks after a gunman killed five co-workers in Louisville. So active shooter safety is top of mind for everyone. I think it's good that they were active and, and responded, you know, and tried to take care of the employees the best they could. Um, yeah, I just that nowadays you have to kind of take everything seriously, whether it is or not. Uh, at this time, it's too early in the investigation to tell. Uh, as you know, swatting is a Class D felony in Kentucky, so um, you know at least we can prosecute it if it is. All police in the community are saying they are thankful things played out this way instead of something much worse. We're following multiple cases in Fayette County courtrooms this morning with two people connected to different death investigations in Lexington standing before a judge. LX 187 League is in studio this morning with what's happening today. Dia, it is said to be a busy morning inside Lexington courtrooms, beginning with a 19-year-old charged for murder sitting for his hearing. 
Jamarion Allen was arrested and charged earlier this month in connection to a deadly shooting on Pine Street in Lexington. According to police, several people got into a fight that led to shots being fired. 21-year-old Clinton Burnett Brown was shot, ultimately dying at the hospital from his injuries. Allen is facing murder charges for Brown's death. His hearing is set for 8.30 this morning in Fayette County District Court. The other case we're following this morning is a woman charged in connection to a man's death in Lexington last year and trying to hide his body. Jennifer Kashuba is being arraigned on charges connected to the death of 40 year old Jimmy Lawrence. According to police, Lawrence died from stab wounds and was linked to Kashuba through public assistance housing records. Lawrence's body found near a dumpster on Cambridge Drive where he and Kashuba were confirmed to be living together. Kashuba facing manslaughter, abuse of a corpse, and tampering with physical evidence charges. Kashuba is going to be arraigned at 9 o'clock this morning inside Fayette County Circuit Court. Dia, back to you. All right, Evan, thank you. It is now 6.05. The dates continue to roll for the trial of one of the officers accused in Breonna Taylor's death. Brett Hankinson, who fired several shots through Taylor's apartment and that of her neighbors the night of the raid, is facing federal civil rights violations. Yesterday, the date for the pretrial hearing began was set for October 30th. Well, it had previously been pushed back as attorneys claimed they needed more time to go through documents related to the case. Hankinson was previously acquitted of state wanton endangerment charges related to the shooting. At charge claimed Hankinson had endangered the lives of Taylor's neighbors when he fired several shots, some of which ended and entered the adjoining apartment. Hankinson is one of four former LMPD officers facing federal civil rights violations in relation to Taylor's case. Five student princesses from the Amtec Electrical have completed a program through the U.S. Department of Labor Registered Apprenticeship Program. The students have worked for the past four years to complete the program, and many will continue to work on their journeyman electrician exam. Over the past few years, these graduates learned how to be electricians, codes, and skills that will help them run projects on their own when they're out in the field. Company's apprenticeship program manager says they hope the projects like this one teach people that there are a lot of different career pathways in that industry. All the different graduates that we've ever had, nobody has ever had the same path. Everybody kind of, they have different experiences throughout. Uh, the big thing that they take away from the class is what I tell people, they're, they're learning why to do things and not just how to do them in the classroom. And so, regardless of their experience on job sites, that they're actually getting that, that learning side of it from us. According to the company, the trade industries have reported a skill gap over the past few years. They hope programs like this one will show students what the occupations actually have to offer. Well, the Kentucky State Fair heading back to Louisville this August with new experiences, great musical acts, and so much more for the entire family. This year's fair is going to be going on August 17th through the 27th with the theme Summer Summed Up. Now, there will be a wide variety of entertainment options, of course, food choices and loads of attractions, all within the boundaries of the Kentucky Expo Center, including the newly announced Beer Fest. That's going to happen August 19th in partnership with the Louisville Ale Trail. The Texas Roadhouse Concert Series is also making its return to the Kentucky State Fair. Early bird admission tickets, including parking at the Kentucky Expo Center, on sale right now, $9 online at participating Kroger stores at the Kentucky Expo Center box office. I love the fair. Fair food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Funnel, funnel cakes. Funnel cakes. Mm -hmm. All the deep fried stuff that you oh, yeah. ought not to be eating, but you know what? <laughs> but it's, it's so just a good. sign uh, for sure. It's a sign of summer and it looks like next week we're Did really gonna see? start. Yeah. I was peeking uh, ahead. Potential for some low to mid eighties next week. We gotta get through this weekend first though. We'll talk about our shower and storm chance. And later on sunrise, it's just about that time when Supreme Court justices begin announcing their most consequential opinions of the term. We're gonna break down the four big cases that you're gonna want to keep an eye on. LX18 News at Sunrise continues after this break. It's 610. Taco Bell wants to liberate Taco Tuesday. It's asking the U.S. Trademark Office to cancel two smaller rivals trademarks on the phrase. Taco John's, which is based in Wyoming, owns Taco Tuesday in 49 states, while Gregory's Restaurant and Bar owns it in New Jersey. Taco Bell reports they wrongly monopolized the use of the phrase in the restaurant industry. Taco John's has a history of defending, though, its trademarks, sending cease and desist letters to anyone infringing on it or using the hashtag on social 
social media. Could take two years for the trademark office to make a decision. I thought Taco Tuesday that was just like a phrase. It's I the mean, taco wars. It is the taco. <laughs> Just don't put the beans in there. <laughs> oh, come on. Beans are good. <laughs> oh, they're not. <laughs> yeah, I guess, I guess it depends on your preference. Uh, we've got a pretty good setup going into the weekend weather-wise. Uh, we've got chances for some showers and storms, but as we've been discussing, a lot of it will be overnight. So this is a look at what's happening this morning. Thankfully, not much. Uh, this is the max track. Now, if we broaden the view out a little bit, you notice that we are clear. And we, of course, we just went through that round of strong to severe storms earlier in the week. National Weather Service out of Jackson was out surveying storm damage. And if we zoom in way in on McGoffin County, we're way out into eastern Kentucky right there, Salyersville. Uh, they do have a report, at least a preliminary report of damage consistent with an EF1 tornado near Hendricks, close to Foraker, way out in uh, McGoffin County there. We get the actual numbers as far as the wind speed goes and more specific details on it. That's the preliminary report. Expecting more of that uh, later on today. Uh, but that puts it in that 86 to 110 mile per hour range. Uh, I think they also uh, at, scattered out some damage in Estill County, but didn't find much there. So high pressure off to the northeast. We've got this east -er easterly to northeasterly flow that is holding today. So we're warm. But we're keeping the humidity down and our precipitation chance is low today, but then starts to spike into the weekend. But notice I got the PM AM up there an indication that a lot of that will go through Friday night into Saturday morning and then hopefully wind down Saturday afternoon. Here's how it plays out with a future track. Do keep an eye out for the potential for a few showers and storms into southeastern Kentucky. Isolated showers and storms here in the bluegrass. A, a bump in cloud cover will go from mostly to partly sunny skies through the day. That's around 10 o'clock tonight. And then watch what happens Friday. Here comes the cold front. This will be the driver behind a more widespread round of showers and thunder showers. That gets going Friday evening, but doesn't really get going here until late Friday evening. So if you got outdoor events planned, Keep that in mind. Now, timing wise, you know, this could speed up or slow down a little bit, but we're talking mainly Friday evening overnight into Saturday mornings. So this is around breakfast time. The front still slowly sagging across eastern Kentucky. Could be a pretty good shot of rain there, but some of those showers will linger all the way through Saturday morning. And I'm hoping to clear it out by Saturday afternoon. We're still running rainfall deficits over an inch and a half for the month here in Lexington, so we need it. And we're going to get it uh, anywhere from a quarter to a half inch on the low end up to maybe an inch of rain on the higher end. We're showing some bands of uh, well over an inch of rain into some of our southeastern counties there. So uh, at least a good shot of wet weather overnight and then hopefully clearing it out the remainder of the weekend. There's a chill in the air. We're in the 40s. Temperature wise, it's 40 for the dew point in the 30s. Northern Kentucky, that's an indication of some dry air in place. So. This is one of those really nice spring days where it's warm, but the humidity is still down, so it's comfortable. You don't have that uh, high humidity making it muggy out there and just a, a really nice combo. But keep an eye out for those isolated showers and storms later today. The same holds for overnight. A lot of your Friday fairly quiet, but here comes the cold front, and that is going to spike the shower and storm chance. That'll come in late Friday evening. Uh, max out overnight and then continue into Saturday morning before winding down. So, you know, as far as the weekend's concerned, you'll probably have a chance to get out Friday afternoon and then again Saturday afternoon through Sunday. Next week could have a hint of summer brewing, consistent low to even mid 80s with some sunshine and looks like a dry stretch of weather as well. I'm loving it, Tom. Thanks so much. It is 614. Time for a check of your top stories on this Thursday morning. President Joe Biden in Japan this morning preparing to meet with world leaders at the G7 summit. The gathering takes place in the city of Hiroshima, the location of the world's first atomic attack. G7 leaders are expected to discuss several issues, including Russia's war on Ukraine and China's threats against Taiwan. New details this morning about the Air National Guardsman who allegedly leaked government secrets. Prosecutors say his superiors warned him several times last year about handling or viewing classified information. He reportedly began raising concerns in September when he was seen taking notes on classified information and putting those notes in his pocket. He is now facing espionage charges. Montana, now the first state in the nation to ban TikTok. The Republican governor there signed a bill Wednesday blocking new downloads of the app in the state. It fines app stores $10,000 per day for each violation. 
The bill is set to go into effect next year, but it's expected to face several legal challenges. It comes as lawmakers on Capitol Hill also consider legislation to restrict the app. <coughs> Excuse me. The U.S. stock futures, though, are flat this morning as Wall Street hoped that the debt ceiling crisis would soon see a resolution. This as market comes off a strong session with major averages jumping more than 1% each on Wednesday. And let's take a look at those stocks with local ties. As you can see, it's a mixed bag with Diageo being down, Brown Forming and Corning up. And on this page as well, a mixed bag, Temper Sealy down, Toyota up, Valvoline down. You're watching LAX 18 News at Sunrise. We'll be right back. You're watching LEX 18 News at Sunrise. We're coming up on 619. So will student loan forgiveness actually happen? Conservatives want to block it as part of the debt ceiling negotiation, but the policy may also get blocked by the United States Supreme Court. Today, justices are expected to announce some decisions, and while the court never reveals in advance what cases get decided on which days, LEX 18 political editor Joe St. George has an in-depth look at the four major issues that will get rulings before the end of June, impacting more than just your family's finances. Well, it's about that time of year. Leaves are now on the trees. The last sign of spring has emerged. And politically here in Washington, that means one thing. The Supreme Court of the United States is getting ready to issue their rulings. Everything from your family's finances to the future of the Internet is at stake. Big issue number one, student loan forgiveness. <laughs> It's been a few months since rallies happened outside the court supporting President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. As a reminder, the president wants 10 grand forgiven for individuals making less than 125,000 a year. $20,000 could be forgiven if you received Pell Grants while in college. When the high court rules, it also starts the clock for when student loan payments begin again. Studentaid.gov says that happens 60 days after litigation ends. Big issue number two, the future of the internet. Two cases deal with whether social media sites like YouTube and Twitter are liable for the content that gets posted. If justices rule that social media sites are accountable, it could mean new restrictions on what can be posted online since companies will want to limit litigation. Big issue number three race. There are a couple of cases on this one. First, the Supreme Court will decide whether applications to go to college can include questions about race. Already, nine states outlaw the practice. The Supreme Court's opinion could ban it nationwide, deeming it violates equal protection laws. And then there is race and elections. Justices will rule whether Alabama properly drew its congressional districts. Currently, around a quarter of the voters in the state are black. However, only one congressional district is made up of majority black voters. The court's opinion could make it easier for lawmakers to draw maps nationwide without the worry of lawsuits regarding race. And finally, big issue number four, religious liberty. This case involves a web designer from Colorado. She wants to start designing wedding websites, but says her faith won't allow her to create ones for same-sex couples. She would like the Supreme Court to say it's okay, even though the state has already told her she needs to serve everyone if she wants to operate. In recent years, justices have sided with bakers and coaches in cases where religious liberty was allegedly threatened. Critics feared the opinion could open the door for more denials of constitutional rights for LGBTQ plus Americans. Joe St. George, Scripps News, Washington. According to the White House, if President Joe Biden's student loan relief plan goes through, there are 563,300 Kentuckians eligible for up to $10,000 in relief, as well as 394,000 Pell Grant recipients who could get up to $20,000 forgiven. This means more than $13.5 billion of student debt could be forgiven just here in the Commonwealth of Kentucky. It is 622 coming up after the break. Got to get a look at your Hollywood headlines. Prince Harry and Duchess Meghan recently chased by paparazzi for several hours. We'll have details and they may be the most iconic pair of shoes ever created. See why one Minnesota man is in trouble because of them. But first, here's a quick check of your lottery jackpots. Tomorrow's Kentucky Mega Millions jackpot, $132 million. Saturday's Kentucky Powerball jackpot, $162 million. You got to play to win. We are back in two. Well, at 624, let's take a look at some Hollywood headlines. Prince Harry and his wife, Meghan, the Duchess of Sussex, were involved in what has been described as a near catastrophic hours long car chase with paparazzi on Tuesday through the streets of New York City. A spokesperson for the Prince said in a statement, the near catastrophic car chase came, quote, at the hands of a ring of highly aggressive paparazzi. 
It added this relentless chase lasted over two hours, resulting in several near collisions involving other drivers on the streets of New York, pedestrians and two NYPD officers. Incident came after the couple attended the Women of Vision Awards at the New York Ziegfeld Ballroom Tuesday. Megan's mom was also in the car. A Minneapolis man has been charged with stealing the iconic ruby slippers from the Wizard of Oz. The indictment alleges in 2005, 76 year old Terry Martin stole an authentic pair of ruby slippers that were worn by Judy Garland in the 1939 film. Authorities say the theft, the thief rather, broke into the Judy Garland Museum in Grand Rapids, smashed a glass case in the gallery and stole the slippers. Authorities recovered them in 2018 during an undercover operation in Minneapolis. Conservators examined the slippers and determined yeah, they are the ones, they're authentic. They are one of four remaining pairs. Martin is charged with one count of theft of major artwork. The slippers are reportedly valued at three and a half million dollars and are highly regarded as the most recognizable memorabilia in American film history. Despite years of speculation, the museum confirms the burglary was not an inside job. Well, there's plenty of action headed to the big and little screen in the next few weeks. Here's Douglas Hyde with the Hollywood Minute. None of our lives can matter more than this mission. I don't accept that. A brand new trailer is providing a preview of some of the amazing stunts you'll see in Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1. The movie finds Ethan Hunt and his team on a mission to prevent a deadly new weapon from falling into the wrong hands. The seventh installment in the billion dollar action franchise hits theaters July 12th. I'm a killer, but I'm also a mother. The Mother is currently streaming on Netflix and proving women can still be action stars at the age of 53. Much to the delight of its lead, Jennifer Lopez. Yeah, it's funny, you know, you think I'd get roles like this in my 20s, and I'm getting them now, and, I, and it's so em empowering for me. I'm like, I can do this, I'm going to do this, and I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna train every day, and I worked out every day, and I did the fight training, and I learned how to fight better. You were born to leave the sea and land, my son. Perhaps it's only fitting that Aquaman is hosting Shark Week this year. Yes, Jason Momoa will be diving in as the master of ceremonies for the 35th year of the famous Discovery Channel franchise, which kicks off in July. In Hollywood, I'm Douglas High. Oh yeah, it's 627 coming up after the break. Storm Tracker meteorologist Tom Ackerman is going to be joining us with another look at forecast, what you need to know before you step out the door. Sunrise will be right back. Count on LEX 18 News. Coming up, the Lexington community is going to be saying final goodbyes to State Representative Lehman Swan, who passed away over the weekend. Plus, we look back on the key takeaways from Tuesday's primary that could affect the governor's race in November. And while President Joe Biden is in Japan today for the G7 summit, negotiators continue to find agreement on the nation's debt ceiling. This is LEX 18 News at sunrise. This is 6.30 a.m. sharp. Good morning, everybody. It's Thursday, May 18th. I'm Dia Davidson, joined by meteorologist Tom Ackerman with a look at the forecast. Well, we've got some news as far as the storms go mm -hmm. from earlier this week that we'll talk about. Also, some news for the upcoming weekend. Good. Uh, shower and storm chance, which is actually beneficial because we need the rain and a lot of it could very well come through overnight. So there are some pluses, even though we've got that active weather into the weekend. This is what it looks like this morning. Not much to show you on the max track and the future track. Still bringing in, like it did yesterday, a few showers and thunder showers across our far southern border, isolated if we see much of anything here in the bluegrass. But even our eastern Kentucky counties have a development of a, at least a few passing showers, some isolated rumbles of thunder. So we're not free and clear of precipitation today. It's just a very limited chance. That changes going into the weekend, especially Friday night into Saturday morning. It's 42 now in Cynthiana. It is chilly out there. You head up into northern states, they've got frost advisories and freeze warnings out. We're far enough south, it's chilly, but we're not near that level. 49 in Lebanon, 49 down in Campbellsville. We're going to make it up into the upper 70s today, and then upper 70s tomorrow, and then low 70s Saturday. That's after that cold front brings that round of showers, thunder showers through overnight into Saturday morning. We'll talk about how much rain we could pick up and how that impacts the rest of the weekend coming up. Alrighty, Tom, thanks so much. It is 631. The Lexington community will be coming together to remember and honor the life and legacy of a local lawmaker who passed away over the weekend. LAX 18's Evan Leak is in studio with what's happening today. 
the uh, layman swan never allowed his disabilities to define him. Living with cerebral palsy and confined to a wheelchair, he used his disability as a driver to push for expanding rights for people going through what he went through every day. And today, the community he fought for gets their chance to say goodbye. Swan was hospitalized on May 10th for a medical emergency, according to his mother. This past Sunday, four days after he was admitted, the Kentucky State Representative passed away. Swan was elected to office last year and worked with several committees, transportation, health services, economic development, the list goes on, working to create change across the Commonwealth. We spoke to local politicians on Sunday after news of Swan's death broke, sparking a message of thanks to a man who never stopped fighting for Kentuckians. He did not allow his physical challenges, the challenges of his body to hold him back. In politics, it's a world that is oftentimes just so cynical and every single day he showed up and he found the good in people. A public memorial is being held tonight for the community to say goodbye to State Representative Swan. That's being held at 5 o'clock at Gray Line Station in Lexington where people are invited to come share stories, reflections and insights on what Swan meant to them and the legacy he leaves behind. Dia, back to you. All right, Evan, thanks so very much. It is 633. With the primary now behind us, the focus now shifts to the November general election. But experts say there are some important takeaways, though, from Tuesday night's election. Attorney General Daniel Cameron is now, of course, a Republican nominee for governor, set to take on incumbent Democratic Governor Andy Bashir. For the first time, there will be more registered Republicans in the Commonwealth than Democrats, but experts say beating Governor Bashir is not going to be easy. Polls show he is the most popular Democratic governor in America, and his job approval rating is high. Bashir's popularity here is not as surprising as people make it out to be. If you look at the most popular governors, they tend to be people from one party representing an electorate that tilts in the other direction. Another takeaway, big money doesn't always help. Kelly Kraft and her family invested more than $10 million of their own personal wealth into her race, outspending every other candidate. But when the results came in, Kraft ended up in third place, not even close to the winner. Business owners in Madison County are celebrating after people voted to allow countywide alcohol sales. Until Tuesday night, large portions of Madison County were dry. Alcohol was either not allowed to be sold or could only be done so on a limited basis and not at all on Sundays. Owner of Apollo Pizza was one of the driving forces behind getting the measure on the ballot. He says the location in northern Madison County would have had to close without those alcohol sales. With going wet, the potential just climbs dramatically and so we can really throw ourselves into this location and really try and make it the best it can be. We don't have to watch people walk in the door, find out that, 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 that this is the one location where you can't get beer in an Apollo pizza and walk back out. There's now a 60 day wait period though before alcohol licenses can be issued. Kentucky's bourbon industry is thriving last year. It became a $2.1 billion industry, but in order to keep growth going, Kentucky lawmakers agreed to get rid of a tax that some counties say is essential to their budgets. Franklin County brings in hundreds of thousands of dollars every year in verbal bourbon barrel taxes. The judge executive says it's about 8% of the emergency budget, which means it's equivalent of a ladder truck for the fire department, 23 sheriff's vehicles, or the salary for half the deputies in the jail. Kentucky Distilleries Association believes the change will help its members despite seeing record profits and growth. By 2043, the barrel tax will be eliminated, but Judge Muller says his office has already started planning. We're, we're having to take a step back because I can tell you, you know, we're in the process of, of building some new parks and we literally were thinking about a whole lot bigger budget to do it and we probably cut it in half because of what's coming down the road. Franklin County is one of eight other counties expected to feel the impact of the tax cut the most. The judge executive there says the county is working on not raising taxes. Data from the county shows as the bourbon tax revenue grew, property tax rates decreased. Well, at 636 overnight, President Joe Biden arrived in Japan for the G7 summit. Back home, though, his team of negotiators working to prevent the U.S. from defaulting on its national debt obligations for the first time in U.S. history. Bree Jackson is in Washington with the latest on where negotiations stand. President Biden in Japan, focusing on foreign issues amid optimism in debt ceiling talks back home. Every leader in the room understands the consequences if we fail to pay our bills. And it would be catastrophic for the uh, for the American economy and the American people. 
But now we're along such a short timeline, it makes it almost harder. While he is cutting his overseas trip short, critics blasted the president, saying he waited until the last minute to negotiate directly with GOP leaders. Accept the fact that we must change how this town spends money. Inaction and intransigence will not wipe away $32 trillion in debt. Some Democrats appear frustrated with negotiations and urge the president to invoke the 14th Amendment, arguing it would be unconstitutional for the government to not pay its bills. I do think it's very, very, very important that the president keep his constitutional option uh, on the table in case negotiations break down. Experts say doing so could spark a bitter legal fight. For now, both sides appear focused on reaching a compromise. I'm hopeful the president's team will join House Republicans to produce a responsible spending agreement. We're going to come together because there's no alternative. Negotiators have less than two weeks to either find a solution or risk a first ever debt default. And today, Vice President Harris will provide an update on the debt ceiling and the potential impacts of a default. In Washington, Bree Jackson, NBC News. It's 638. Tenants in Lexington still have a chance to learn about their rights as tenants and hear presentations about renting in Lexington. Wednesday, there were two chances to participate in these discussions. There are presentations by Kentucky Fair Housing Council, Lexington Fayette Urban County Government Code Enforcement, Legal Aid of the Bluegrass with a panel discussion, including those organizations and the Fayette District Judges. I think it's important for tenants especially to know what is allowed? What's not allowed? What, when you go to court, what will be expected from you? What is not expected? What, what are you allowed to do as a tenant? What is your landlord responsible for? And so with 51% of Fayette County renting, I think it's extremely important. This is their fourth workshop. They did three last year and plan to do three this year. They also plan to host a Spanish speaking workshop later this summer. Well, people in Carlisle were able to shop at a grocery store in their town for the first time in nearly two years after the city's only grocery store was destroyed in the devastating flood. The Save-A-Lot was abandoned after sustaining heavy damage. Customers said not having a store available was causing them to suffer by not having fresh produce or meat. Keith DeFisher is the store owner, and he says the new store is built on higher ground. Well, it's been a rough road. Um, we ran into a lot of rock here through COVID, problems getting the metal, all the supplies. It, it does my heart good to see all these people come in here. And they're, they're, we've heard a lot of customer comments today. Thank you for opening. Well, the store is also significantly larger than the last store. There are 400 more products on the shelves. All righty, it's 640 here on LAX 18 News at Sunrise. We've got active weather going into the weekend, but a lot of it will go through overnight, which is some good news. We'll see where we're headed, get some updates on Tuesday, storms, a lot to get to. And later on Sunrise, Kentucky Derby winner Mage still has a shot at becoming the next Triple Crown winner as he takes the track this weekend for the Preakness Stakes. Going to hear from his trainer ahead of the big race coming up about 650. But first, let's head outside. Courtesy of the City of Lexington for your LX18 traffic tracker, you're going to be looking at Man of War at Pimlico Parkway. You know what? There is an injury crash, though. Trade Street at Leestown Road, at least one lane is blocked. And a heads up, the Valley View Ferry will be reopening today for the first time since December after some much needed maintenance work is performed. Traffic volume picking up all around the city, so take it easy out there. This is LX18 News at Sunrise. Be right back. It is 643. All right, how sweet is this one? Alabama could soon have a state cookie. And it's thanks to some students at Trinity Presbyterian School in Montgomery. It's called the Yellow Hammer. Trinity fourth graders came up with the idea for a state cookie while studying Alabama state history. They found out several states do have a state cookie, but Alabama well, they don't, and, and so they're going to be mixing up some pecans, oats, and peanuts, and peanut butter, filling in the cookie this week to make their own state cookie. This week, the House of Representatives there, the State House, approved the Yellow Hammer as a state cookie. It's now headed to the State Senate for approval, and while Kentucky does not have a state cookie, our state drink, which is milk, would go really, really well with a plate full of cookies, and so maybe that's something that we could 
maybe put a, a bug in the First Lady Brittany Bashir's ear, and maybe she could state cookie talk about that with some know. kids. It's yeah, gonna, it's going to be hard to beat as cool a name as the Yellow Hammer. <laughs> <laughs> what a great um, cookie name! Yeah, I'm telling you, it is. But you know what? Would be really great is to sit outside and mm -hmm. enjoy a glass of milk today under a tree. Yeah, well, you can do that. Uh, we've got uh, temperatures warming into the upper 70s, uh, so it is going to be warm. And the nice thing about today is it's warm, but the humidity is still in check, so it's comfortable. And our distillery district live camera back online looking great, as does the Max Track. I want you to keep your eyes out down south today, though. The possibility is there. Uh, that we could see a few showers and storms. Quick update from the National Weather Service out of Jackson. They did some uh, damage scouting yesterday, a storm survey, and found preliminary information indicative of an EF1 tornado in McGoffin County uh, near Hendricks, right there, Salyersville. So way out into eastern Kentucky. They checked out some damage in Estill County and didn't find much there as far as tornado, uh, tornadic activity. But an EF1, somewhere in that 86 to 110 mile per hour range, we'll get an actual wind speed on it as they finish that report and, and uh, confirm it uh, later today. Max track shows low pressure, south high pressure, northeast. We've got a bit of a northeast to easterly flow to the wind. One of the reasons the humidity is down. And I was just tweeting about this, how, you know, if you've got to have a weekend rain chance, this is about as good as it gets. It'll be overnight, Friday night into Saturday. Don't expect severe weather, but could be a solid soaker for some. A good shot of rain coming in. And uh, a lot of people may have it happening while they're asleep. So even better news there. The future track does show that we've got that chance. It's limited, but it's there. A few showers and storms. Southeastern Kentucky counties will keep it isolated here in the bluegrass. Most of the moisture stays locked up down south until we get this cold front coming in tomorrow night. Here it comes, and here comes that round of showers and storms. Now, it'll get in here late Friday evening. This is 10 o'clock, so you know, a lot of your Friday afternoon, you'll probably be fine. Uh, but into Friday evening, overnight, and then Saturday morning, you can see that post-frontal shower activity still kicking in Saturday morning. It'll gradually push east. Some of the heaviest rain could very well be across southeastern Kentucky as you get down around, say, Bell County, Harlan County. Future track, as far as rainfall goes, shows a band of anywhere from one to two inches trying to get going down there. Will likely generally be around about a quarter to a half an inch with some higher amounts pushing an inch in spots. It's 49 degrees. There's a chill in the air. The humidity is down. The dew points in the mid 30s. That is dry air up in the northern Kentucky and even dew points in the 40s to low 50s. Still very dry and very comfortable. You get into the 60s. That's where you start to feel that mugginess really kicking in. And we will be, our highs uh, will be warm in the upper 70s today and tomorrow. A brief dip behind the cold front Saturday, uh, but then a warm up next week, which could give us a a little bit of a summer preview here, so check it out for today. Breaking it down, uh, beautiful day, sunshine early on. We'll end up going partly sunny by later on today. And yes, that isolated shower and storm chance here. The rain chance Friday, I'm starting out at 9 a.m. and finishing it up at 9 p.m. Notice when the best chance is later into your Friday evening. So much of the day should be fairly quiet. And then we'll have those lingering showers, possibly some isolated thunder showers Saturday morning. Next week, check it out. High pressure taking over and we start to heat it up. Our normal high of 76. We'll be in the low to potentially even mid 80s, and it could be a few days of that on the way. So some uh, summer like warmth building in toward the middle of next week.